Hello everyone and welcome back to the Where Am I podcast episode 14, the podcast where we explore the world of archaeology virtually because at the moment it's still quite difficult to do that physically. I'd like to thank you for um, joining me again for another episode or if this is your first time joining me for an episode then welcome. And to apologise again for the slight lateness of the episode this week. But because I'm doing it slightly later, both in the week and in the daytime, you know, it's now in the sort of afternoon, evening. It means that uh, I'm enjoying a nice beer with this podcast rather than having a coffee. Ah, nice and refreshing. So again, thank you very much for tuning in again for this episode. So last week we were at La Scale Cave in France, where I gave you the clues for where I will be this week. And those clues are a famous Aris culture burial site in East Yorkshire. And this again might give you a clue. This drawing here done by myself. It is actually the only picture in this week's episode. I do apologise for lack of pictures this week. Uh, it's famous for its chariot burials. And the village the site is near and makes up actually part of the site name has a very unusual name with two interpretations. A field for the trial of a legal action, or a wet field. So those are the clues. Now whilst um, you think those over, if it's your first time hearing them and you haven't guessed where we are left, or if you um, didn't, or if you just haven't uh, figured out where I am, let's have a look a little bit at the Aris culture. The Aris culture is an archaeological culture of the Middle Iron Age, around about 400 to 100 BC, in East Yorkshire, and takes its name from the Aris Farm uh, site near Market Wayton. The Aris culture is defined by its burial practice that shares similarities uh, to those that are found on continental Europe, particularly around the Paris Basin, and it also shares similarities to the Latin culture. Uh, the burial practices of the Aris culture include chariot burials, square enclosures or barrows. Uh, chariots are actually sometimes buried within a square enclosure with a barrow on top as well. Uh, grave goods, you know, these ideas of royal graves, um, got chariot fittings and bronze mirrors are often bound. Um, but other grave goods that are often associated with Aris culture burials or you find in Aris culture burials are copper alloy objects, iron objects, animal bones such as pig, um, pig appears quite prominently, especially in some of the burials we'll be looking at today. Coral, jet and enamel objects. Uh, and unlike the um, uh, sort of burials you find on continental Europe, chariots are actually disassembled um, and placed over or around the body, whereas, you know, there are some which are buried, sort of chariots are buried fully in uh, places in continental Europe. So again, um, oh yes, burials with horses are rare. A notable, notable example of Aris culture with a horse burial is at Pocklington. So there, I've given you a bit of extra time and maybe a few other clues to where we might be this week. And I have to say, this is actually, the site has one of my favourite names of any archaeological site. Uh, in the UK, maybe in the entire world, and that is the site of Wet Wang Slack. Uh, I probably enjoy it for certainly maybe immature reasons, but also I think it just has a nice ring to it, Wet Wang. Uh, but moving on, it's quite a um, information-packed episode today, so we'll crack on and we'll have a little bit of a look at Wet Wang Slack. Now, Wet Wang Slack is a uh, small historic village in the East Riding of Yorkshire. Um, it is known uh, for uh, a large Iron Age cemetery, uh, which also includes pre uh, previous um, chariot bales. That gives you a big clue to what we're looking at today. And these were excavated during the 1970s and the 1980s. So a brief summary of these previous chariot burials are uh, Burial 1, uh, the grave lay within a tri triangular ditched enclosure uh, but the northernmost 
north and easternmost uh, edges of this ditch had uh, been damaged by previous uh, machine work, maybe some quarrying which has been done in the area. The remains of a young male adult lying on his right side with his knees drawn up to his body uh, was discovered along with pig bones that had been placed on top of the body and the iron tyres, nave loops of both wheels um, survived, as did several spokes, which is quite rare, and the axle of the chariot was also present in that burial as well. Looking at burial two, the second burial was contained within a square ditched enclosure, um, and the skeletal remains were found at the centre of the barrow and were of a young adult female, also facing to the right with her legs, bent and her arms extended. Again, pig bones were also deposited on top of the skeleton. Um, soil marks show the position where the complete dismantled chariot uh, was placed on top of her, uh, sorry, beneath her in this instance, including its extended pole to which the yoke would have been attached. So the pole and the yoke which attaches the chariot to the horses. And there's a selection of other chariot fittings uh, which were also discovered in this burial, which included iron tyres, bronze nave hoops, four spokes and turret rings. Behind the head and shoulders of the skeleton, there were also two horse bits which were found, a bronze case with a chain attached, a, a pin, a bronze pin and a bronze mirror. Finally, the third burial um, from this period, um, actually, again, this, um, the northern edge of this enclosure was also damaged by quarrying and it also um, damaged uh, the upper part of the cranial remains um, of the skeleton in this burial. But as with the other burial, the body was placed on top of a dismantled chariot and was of a young adult um, facing uh, also to the right with the thighs drawn right up at right angles to the torso. Iron tyres and nave hoops also survived in this burial along with some other chariot fittings. The axle again was also present, an iron sword uh, in its scabbard with bronze decoration lay diagonally across the body and two rings with central studs of coal may have also been fitted to this sword belt as evidence of coal was found in the grave as well. But although we're sort of looking at wet wang slack in a, in, in, in a wide context today, I sort of want to specifically look at the chariot burial that was discovered during 2000 and 2001. So wet wang slack, 2000 to 2001. In a small paddock in a historic village of wet wang, uh, an area was identified uh, by a developer as a perfect spot for a small building development. But because uh, Wet Rang, as we just previously talked about, was an area which was well known uh, in the early, by, by the, early 2000, the early 2000 as a um, important site for Iron Age archaeology, and also it is a uh, historical village, the local authorities decided that the site needed to be investigated before planning could be granted to the developers. So the, uh, the um, council and the developers got in Guildhouse Consultancy to undertake the initial investigations. Um, and before the actual inv investigation uh, excavation was actually carried out, they did record the contours of the land and geophysical and carried out a geophysical survey to try and identify features um, that might be below the surface. The excavation began in 2000, initially by long machine dug trenches, which uh, revealed uh, chalk built walls just below the surface. So this led to a change in the initial excavation strategy and techniques and led to investigation of a much larger area because of these chalk built walls that were discovered. This wide investiga investigation revealed an Iron Age slash Romano British ditched enclosure, a medieval building dating to around about the 13th or 14th century, and the upper part of a well that is estimated to be around 50 metres deep. These investigations revealed that the areas were of uh, archaeological interest, 
um, but not enough to actually refuse planning permission, but enough for the entire area to be excavated. The archaeology re uh, team returned in early 2001 to carry out the work, excavating the line of the entrance road into the development and the sites of the houses. However, because of a previously uh, unknown uh, TPO, or tree preservation order, the entrance road actually had to be moved um, from the original plans to accommodate that, and it was in this new area that our story starts to unfold in the discovery of a square ditch enclosing a rectangular pit. This both raised a lot of bells and excitement with the excavation team, as this discovery was suspected to potentially be an Iron Age square barrow based on the previous excavations and knowledge of Aris culture in the area and at Wetwang, and it could even be a very rare chariot burial. So what did happen? Well, let's go look. Let's uh, have a look. Now this discovery raised several questions. What should they do about this new discovery? Should attempts be made to preserve the barrow to save it for later excavation or um, a way of preserving it and incorporating it undisturbed in the housing development to stop it from um, being uh, destroyed? Or should it be excavated if so how now excavating did pose a couple of issues because the funds from the developer for the site as it was originally defined would not cover the cost of excavation of the unprecedented find of the barrow excavations are very costly and several things had to be taken into account such as the actual excavation costs um, who would pay to look after the potentially very delicate and fragile artefacts, long-term storage and conservation costs. All of these need to be taken in consideration before the excavation. It's not enough, just enough to excavate it. You've also then got to look after it and care for it for the first, on a long-term basis. So because, again, this site was potentially thought to be very important and significant, expert advice was sought from uh, English Heritage and the British Museum, and the following plan was drawn up. It was decided that English Heritage would fund the excavation and that the British Museum would send a team to assist with the excavation and on-site conservation of uh, and lab work of any associated finds if they found any. These excavations took place mainly in March of 2001 and for non-UK uh, listeners March in, in the UK can be very unpredictable. There was wind, there was rain and there was even snow and by March, building uh, work had actually, preliminary building work had already started on the site. So the site was very busy quite cold, quite damp, quite wet. So one way of actually protecting the artefacts and the excavation area was after the outer ditch had been examined, work concentrated on the actual grave itself and a plastic tent was actually erected over the excavation to help keep out the worst of the weather. Although previous experience of uh, Aris culture finds suggests that generally these burials are at least generally normally over one meter deep its excavation still had to be carried out very cautiously subtle changes in soil color, soil color and composition could provide evidence for any internal structures of the graves or any funeral rites that were associated with the burial and if um it wasn't undertaken cautious uh, in a cautious manner then these could be lost uh, or damaged, destroyed, not recorded. So the soil was carefully removed in horizontal slices or spits and then photographed and planned as each level was exposed. The grave was also scanned with a metal detector 
And although it revealed that the grave contained a high quantity of metal objects, nothing um, but nothing on sort of what you'd expect from chariot wheels, no signals of large metal signals that indicated chariot wheels. So was it a chariot burial? I kind of already gave away the potential answer in an earlier slide, but we'll go through the process of looking at how the excavation team went about the process. One of the first indications to what they have uncovered came when a green stain was found in the soil at one end of the grave, and this was shown to be a bronze object. And after careful um, excavation, looking at it, it was an ornate horse bit decorated with yellowish dots, which was later identified to be enamel by the British Museum conservation team. A second bit was also found together with several bronze rain rings, also known as terrets, uh, decorated with coal studs through which the rains would have passed. Um, this, these grave good indications gave the team a good idea that they might be dealing with a chariot burial. Again, I apologise for the spelling mistake there, or grammar mistake actually. Um, another thing that they found were hints of long vanished wooden objects, uh, recognisable by only slight changes in soil colour. Under certain conditions, soil can actually form firmly around a wooden object before it decays, taking the shape of the object um, and this then may survive as a void or a hole uh, that can be then recognised uh, by excavators. And being able to distinguish these from, example, animal barrows is very important, as if it is a um, wooden object, you could actually take a cast by pouring power, power, plaster of Paris into the, after you've removed the soil from the void and this can give you the sort of shape of the wooden object. And this was indeed, this was indeed undertaken at uh, the Wetland Slack excavation. So the chariot burial. The discovery of the bits, the rain rings, uh, the hollows um, and the impressions of the wooden objects did convince the team that they were probably dealing with a chariot burial, but further finds allow them to build up a picture of the chariot and the burial and confirm that this was indeed the case. Harness rings uh, had lain across the yoke, so the bit which connects the horse to the chariot, and it was joined to a long harness pole running back towards the rear end of the chariot. Although the whole length of the pole was impossible to retrieve, its shape again could be determined from a short length where an identifiable void survived. Further evidence was also revealed in the conservation laboratory where the small piece of wood was found in the rust on the lower edge of one of the tyres. Um, this gave the width as well as the position of the pole in the grave. At the other end of the grave from the uh, harness fittings, excavators were slightly puzzled about why the grave pit widened out. The answer was revealed um, as the excavation went on, when a further void was discovered in which, on casting, on investigation improved to be, on, on actually, and, and casting the uh, void with the plaster of Paris, proved, proved to be a substantial bit of timber, which was the chariot axle, suggesting that the axle was actually buried as a complete pit, necessitating the widening of the barrow in order to accommodate it. The delicate and, and uh, sort of decorated nature of the harness fittings gave an indication to the excavators that they might be dealing with the burial of a um, woman. As often these the, the coal decorations and the sort of elaborate decorations of the fittings have previously been found mainly within graves which have turned out to be female. So the chariot burial again. 
Further proof that it was in fact a chariot burial came when the team uncovered the wheels, or what was left of them, that overlap, which overlapped the central part of the grave. No traces of the wooden spokes or frame were uncovered. The only part of the wheel still surviving were a pair of nave bands, a linchpin, and a badly decayed corroded iron tyre. The tyre only survived as badly corroded metal and stained soil. This gives a potential explanation as to why these were not picked up on the metal detector, because that it would not have given off a strong um, metal signal. So, uncovering the skeleton. So, so far they hadn't found a body. Was there in fact a body, or was this just a burial chariot? Maybe there wasn't a body because the body wasn't recoverable or went missing, but they still built the barrow with the chariot and some associated objects as like a, a, a cenotaph or, or something along those lines. It is not unknown in prehistory for similar things, or potentially what archaeologists expect when they found an empty barrow, that is what it represents. But did they find a skeleton? Well, as the barrel was excavated, the team gained a good idea of where the body might be if there is one. After the first layers had been excavated, a rectangular patch of soil different in colour and texture from the surrounding soil and remained visible as the layers were removed and the excavation went on. And this area was interpreted, interpreted as the body of the chariot, as the chariot had been dismantled and placed over the body. So in the previous burials, we see the person uh, being placed on top of the chariot. In this case, it's the other way around. As the excavation of the layers continued, the theory that this was where they would find the body was proved correct as the layers were carefully removed revealing the skeletal remains of what was believed to be a woman lying on a chalk, chalk floor in a crouched position. In the grave, the remains of a pig were also discovered and an ornate bronze mirror. And actually along with the um, mirror, um, later analysis showed that it was actually put into a fur bad for a bag and also blue beads and coal beads were also found um, associated with the mirror suggesting that maybe this bag had a very ornate um, sort of drawstring. Now coal such as what's red coal was found in the grave was not natural uh, to the area and one of the actual closest natural deposits would have been around the Red Sea suggesting that potentially there's quite a complicated and quite extensive trading network going on. And along with this, this coal was also found in some of the previous burials we looked at in the earlier Wet Wang excavations, suggesting that this was not just a one-off, you know, there was a good supply of this coral. So the skeleton. And again, I apologise for the mistake on the slide. As the skeletal remains were cleaned and studied, they revealed to be a woman somewhere between the ages of 35 and 45. Now, in comparison to the other um, sort of Aris culture burials, this is actually quite old. A lot of the other women found generally are in their mid-twenties. She was very tall. Uh, she was about uh, five foot uh, seven and a half inches. Um, making her one of the tallest female skeletons found at an Aris culture site. Um, she had healthy teeth, but there was evidence um, of a potential blow to the jaw or fall that caused substantial flakes uh, breaking off from some of her upper and lower molars on her right hand side and the left molars on and molars on the left hand side. She obviously had quite a pot potentially quite a difficult life. Her right shoulder shows signs of advanced osteoarthritis and the head of the humerus shows signs of grinding against the scapula of the shoulder blade bone. The right scapula also has a much larger surface area than the left and also shows signs of arthritis, as does the right clavicle. 
Now, this could indicate that the woman's shoulder was dislocated, uh, probably and unusually backwards at some point, but had started the process of healing, as had the damage to her jaw. It has been suggested that the damage to the teeth, jaw and shoulder bones might be an indication of a fall from a horse or indeed a chariot. Uh, there's a considerable controversy regarding the woman's um, skull, as it appears to show certain asymmetry. And it's also suggested that her entire body may have also shown signs of other asymmetry, so things were not symmetrical, as with what we looked at with her shoulder, with the scapula being much larger than the right, the left being much, sorry, the right being much larger than the left. But... Specialists have not been able to agree on what may have caused this, and indeed some of these uh, changes or this asymmetry may have occurred as changes post-mortem or after death in the burial conditions due to pressure over time and the weight of the chariots and stuff being put onto the body. So, again, there's a bit of controversy there as well. Skeletons, I love skeletons. Skeletons can tell us an awful lot of information. In fact, there's been an awful lot of study on skeletons from the wider um, Iron Age Cemetery at Wet Wang, looking at isotope analysis, uh, which has given indications to things like breastfeeding habits and diet and all different types of other things. And again, I will link those in the description because it's just not the time to talk about them in uh, this episode, unfortunately. So, warrior queen chieftain, who was this female person, this woman? Was she a local queen or chieftain? Was she a priestess? We don't know. I mean, chariot graves are very rare. Only a small number have been found in the UK, I believe, around about only uh, under 30. So those who are buried in such a fashion are obviously important people of great importance in society. And as well as chariots, a lot of these chariot burials, as we've looked at, but especially this chariot burial, you know, it was, you had the presence of the very decorative um, horse and chariot fittings, the mirror, the presence of red coral, the enameled objects, all point to a high status burial burial of some kind and in fact burial traditions such as this are quite rare in the iron age in general because for a lot of places we don't know what is happening with the dead unlike in um you know the the, the bronze age and the um neolithic where there are wider sort of national trends within the country of how people are being treated you don't get the same in the iron age the being able to find iron age cemeteries are you know there's not many that survive certainly not until the much later um iron age period going into the romano british period where they are slightly more common but still quite rare and again, there doesn't really see to it does it's just like the building of of barrows, although they're quite common in Yorkshire, they're quite rare outside of Yorkshire. But you know, Bond's age barrows, although they still they did have regional variations, but you've got round barrows scattered across the country. You had long barrows scattered all over the place, and you know other associated uh, sort of burial monuments. But you don't really get that in the Iron Age. So again, all these are quite unusual and tell us something about the way that people are treating their dead in the Iron Age. Um, so again, we can't really, we don't really know who this lady was. We don't know whether she was a warrior queen or a chieftain, but she was obviously someone of high importance. It is traditional in Iron Age archaeology in Britain to think of Iron Age Britain as a very insular um, country. But again, the presence of things like red coal in these um burials give a good indication that this is not the case because they had to come from somewhere they don't doesn't appear naturally in the waters around britain and one of the closest um one of the closest examples is uh, as i said probably from around around the area of the red sea so it's quite an interesting uh indication to again iron age 
um, economies and trading networks. And again, the, the large quantity of it suggests this isn't just a one-off. There was a supply then being found in some of the earlier chariot burials as well. But what do you think? Let me know who, maybe if you have any ideas about um, who this lady, this female, is or any indication what you think that burial might represent. Have there been any interesting Iron Age discoveries near you? Again, let me know. I would love to hear about them. But that does bring us to the end of this episode, really. And again, I'd just like to apologise for the few errors in the presentation as I went through. I did check it about three times, but I'm very tired at the moment. There's a lot going on, a lot going on in my head. So I must have missed a small things and I didn't get someone to check it for me this time around. So apologies for those. Now, this is actually going to be... Not the last Where Am I ever, but it's certainly not going to be now one for a couple of weeks, mainly because I'm struggling to fit it in with other work I need to be doing. And also, I need to find out more about other sites that I want to cover. Obviously, the difficult thing about this, I can't really um, ask people, ask you guys for ideas of what site to cover, because that kind of defeats the point of the where am I, the clues and all of that so but I guess if you wanted to give me suggest a time period or a geographical area or something like that to look at sites in, you know that would be greatly appreciated, a little bit of inspiration, I still want to keep this regular but for the next couple of weeks there probably, well, I'm just going to say probably there won't be one I may get the time and the inspiration to suddenly do one, but I am going to say that the, the next one won't be until sort of the end of July or early August, just to give me a little bit of breathing space. I am still going to be producing content in terms of my Archeo Gaming series mainly because that's a little bit of fun and that's my way of restressing and it doesn't require as much research and time as putting together these podcast episodes or these episodes but thank you for people who are listening to them and liking to them again if you like them please share them to your friends if you don't like them do tell your enemies if you like the video please give it a like Hit subscribe if you want to get no and hit the notification bell if you want to find out when the next one is going to be uploaded. But also check out Coffee Break Archaeology on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter where I'll be posting updates on when the next episode is. But until then, thank you again for tuning in and until next time, take care. <laughs>